Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Storytime Clinic. This is episode 18. It's time for another guest episode. And let me tell you guys, I am so excited to welcome this phenomenal woman. And our guest today is Hamshatru Maigaba. Born and raised in Mali, Hamshatru has had the privilege of studying and playing basketball professionally in the U.S., in Mali and internationally. She's a former WNBA player. She's a former Olympian, um, a former player for the Mali national team. Hamshatu also knows the value of education. And while she was doing all this, she simultaneously finished her MBA in global management. Now she is giving back to her home country, Mali, on both fronts, education and sports through her personal organization, the Hamshatu Maigaba Foundation, as well as the Special Olympics Mali, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Hamshatu, I'm so happy to welcome you to the show today. How are you? Hello, Fran. How are you? Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So as we all know, the Tokyo 2021 Olympics is going on right now. And as a person who was actually there and made it to the Olympics, what does it feel like for you at this moment to be watching and to, um, you know, do you still follow the Olympics? Do you watch closely at this time? How does this feel to you? It's it's a, a feeling of joy. Definitely. I'm excited. We all look forward to the Olympics. But joy, especially for all the athletes that get to go there and uh, work so hard for this moment. So pride for them and joy watching them accomplish their dreams, something that they've been, like I said, working for so long to try to accomplish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what was that experience like for you? What year did you go in? We we went in 2008, and um, I would say the, 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 uh, the prelude to that is the, the best for me because in Africa, in order for the African country to go, you have to win the African championship. So mm-hmm. that was something that we I went many years uh, back to the uh, Mali national team, and in 2007 we were finally able to accomplish that. And I was wow. the icing in the cake was it yes. gave us the opportunity to qualify for the Olympics. So yes, yeah, yes, that's uh, that's a very big title to yeah, have. <laughs> yeah, it was a pride moment, you know, very proud moment. Yes. And, uh, thankful to have been part of uh, a group that was able uh, that was able to accomplish that. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sure you're very proud of that. That's amazing. Yes, <laughs> um, so looking back on your history, how did you first get into sports? Who inspired you? You know, my my was I always joke and say I didn't have any other choice. But I breastfed it. <laughs> I was breastfed. <laughs> <laughs> my my I like mom that. was a basketball player. And my dad. Oh, your soccer. mom. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, so it runs in the family. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So mm-hmm, that was. Mm-hmm. I was started very young with many of my siblings. One of our uncle took us to a basketball practice, and okay. From that day on, I you know definitely fell in love with basketball. Mm-hmm. And the That's rest was history. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's very good. Did you ever do any other sports or was basketball from the beginning? Yes, I actually played soccer. I would, I did soccer, track and field because my mom also did track and field. So I used okay. to do long distance. I wasn't fast. I was long distance and a uh, high jump. Okay. And soccer okay. also. But mm-hmm. the track and field, I never went to a team. It was only through the school. Mm-hmm. When I was going to school in Mali, our uh, school competition, I would compete on those uh, uh, disciplines. But um, mm-hmm. soccer was something I joined a club, but it was okay when I had a soccer game, I could miss basketball practices to go. And okay. unfortunately, one day I had a basketball game and a soccer game. My and you had to choose? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My coach basically is like, I'm okay, you're missing practices for game, but now it's a game, so you're going to have to make yes. a decision. Yes. And at the time, <laughs> yes, I love basketball and also uh Soccer wasn't that big. Women's soccer wasn't that big in my country. So it I became see, like an I easy see. choice, I would say, and mm-hmm, I basketball, mm-hmm. which I am mm. thankful that I did. <laughs> yes. So your mom won out in that situation. How did your dad feel about that decision? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, 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 I think he, got, he was okay with it. He was okay 
true because, <laughs> like I said, milk, women's soccer was not that popular in Mali at yeah. the time, and um, basketball was a uh, a more uh, easy choice and something that mm-hmm. again my mom played also. So yes, as long as yes. for them it was okay, as long as we were active. At mm-hmm, the end of the day, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Very, very good. So how did you move from um, that to uh, coming to the United States? I played, I started playing when I was about nine years old. And okay. I left, the first time I left my country was 97 to go to uh, Senegal to play uh, mm-hmm. with Dakar University Club. Mm-hmm. I, um, while playing there, first Senegal saw me because I went with my club, Julie Ba. Jodi mm-hmm. in Mali went to an African uh, club championship and um, mm-hmm. somebody from Duke, the president of Duke saw me and wanted me to come play there. So I went there for uh, about seven months, played there, was going to school. And while doing that, joined the national team in December to go play mm-hmm. for uh, at the African championship for Mali. While mm-hmm. playing at that competition, one of the coaches from my old dominion, was there, Coach Scott, Alisa Scott, she was there recruiting, and she offered me a mm-hmm. scholarship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's wow. how my, path, wow. my life path was uh, definitely changed because of that meeting. Her offering me the scholarship gave me the opportunity to come to U.S. and uh, yes, push yes. my uh, studies, truly giving me opportunity to be a, a true student athlete, which yes, unfortunately yes. in my country is uh, the challenge. Yes, yes. So growing up, um, did you ever imagine that you would have been able to um, go this far with sports alone? I I would be lying if I said so. I would be lying. As to say, as I played, the more, the more I played, I could see the possibilities. But initially, even my studies were kind of uh, defined by that because when I came to the, to the States, I thought I was going to do my four years, study and go back. Because mm-hmm. of that, I needed to take a, a field what I feel like once I go back, I can be self-dependent, and which mm-hmm. was one of the reasons I chose information technology. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. initially, I wouldn't say that I thought that I would have the same path. I had a work ethic and the love for basketball, yeah. for sure. But yeah. I yeah. never imagined that I, I could make it as far as I did. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Now, I know one of the... Um, stereotypes i guess i would say with with student athletes is that they are really not in school for the school portion of things that you know it's most people have the focus of um being so much into their sports you know so they can excel professionally and get into the professional teams and everything but really it's a it's a big um commitment to um and sacrifice and a lot of work you know goes into um being able to play at such a at such a high level and do it consistently while you're also balancing your your studies and you picked you know a a difficult (laughs) um a difficult area as well information technology so um what kind of things did you do to to keep yourself motivated on both ends there how did you juggle that yeah i i definitely couldn't agree more with you it's it's a challenge you know to not only be just a student or just be an athlete, period. But having to do both at the same time requires mm-hmm. a lot. And mm-hmm. initially, my our uh, uh, academic advisor kind of discouraged me about taking uh, information technology because coming in, mind you, I didn't speak English. So mm-hmm. my first three months was to focus on English only, and I only started school uh, in December. Okay. Knowing all that, I had to put uh, the chances on my side. and. Since growing up, I feel I'm thankful because uh, my parents have already instilled in us that discipline and making sure that I could play basketball because I showed that I love basketball, but their criteria was I needed to do well in school. So Mm -hmm. I kind of pushed myself or told myself that this is my ticket to play basketball. Mm -hmm. Whether I like school or not, this was my ticket. So I kind yeah. of find a new uh, a new love for school, I would say, because of that, because it was important. I love basketball, and this was a mean for me to do it, and I focus on my studies. And while in college, definitely not knowing the language was the biggest challenge for me first. So I needed to do yeah. extra, which was with yeah. practice, practice. 
So the practice mm-hmm. for me was not only on the basketball side, but I had to practice more, read more books, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. do extra homeworks for me to get better in the mm-hmm. English side. And in the same token, it comes with the uh, discipline, the structure to it that you have to uh, self-instill. Because you know that, for instance, even in the choice of your friends, it's important who you befriend. Because when mm-hmm. I was at practice, my friends were, that were not athletes would be studying. So I couldn't come out of my practice and go and have fun with them because then one would have studied. Yeah. So those are little <laughs> things that I had uh, started putting on myself. And, okay, these, these are my goals. I wanted to get these certain grades in all my classes. And in order for me to do that, what is I needed to do? Do I needed to do extra homework in here? Extra, um, um, uh, how you call it, uh, time reading? Whatever it was, I needed to have a discipline in place and uh, uh, the resilience to follow through, basically. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's that's very, very, um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a big juggling act, but I, I think that um, in doing that early as well, you know, it, it gives you the kind of, um, skills and mentality that you're going to kind of use throughout your your life you know so yes. that was a good a good yeah. start for you mm-hmm. that's true so we, how we you... always mention that that uh yeah. what we learn as student athletes those skills are transferable skills those are skills mm-hmm. that whether it's in basketball but in our overt life or as you call it you can still apply those uh those skills yeah yes yeah now, how did you end up getting involved with the Special Olympics? That also is my coach in um, in college, uh, Coach Larry. She's the the one that I would uh, I have to thank for because um, when we were in college, we used to do a lot of clinics with uh, those with intellectual disabilities. That's how I got to know what Special Olympics. So every year we have them. They come to our camps. Uh, we do special camp specifically, specifically for them every year and we interact with them and the joy and, and how they love doing it has always been uh, something that marked me and I think once I finished playing in 2014 I uh, looked one of my uh, teammates mentioned to me that she's doing something with Special Olympics I'm like oh interesting they were basically reaching out to do like a, uh, a survey to find out they want to get more women involved with Special Olympics. And okay. I looked it up, I answered their questions and stuff, and I'm like, hmm, huh. you know, I never thought of this when I was playing, but in Mali, we do have those people with intellectual disabilities. And they are left on the side. They are uh, stigmatized. People hide them. And, you know, with the African culture, it's, it's, they are seen as if they're bad luck, taboo, all kinds of stuff. You know mm. that they go mm-hmm. to, and I'm like, this is an area that in US, though it's still a challenge, but they have been given a platform where they can have be like be just like anyone. Mm-hmm. So I reach out and I ask, yes, sure enough, Mali was not there, and they invited me to the Special Olympic one in California here, Northern California, I attended, and from there I was put in touch with the Special Olympic uh, Africa. And okay. I got in touch with them, and I showed interest that I would like to have the program. I started Mali, mm-hmm. and that's how we all started. <laughs> wow, wow, yeah. that's amazing to have um, created an entire branch where it didn't exist at all in your in your country, and it's it's something that's very meaningful because, as you said, there's um, not usually a lot of opportunities and um, not a lot of positive ways that society sees people with um, intellectual disabilities so to be able to have something that's just catered towards them and and changing some of that perspective is is incredible yeah um for anyone who's listening who doesn't really know about the special olympics um how would you what is the organization what's their goal what's their mission well special olympic basically we um we use sports as a as a way to um give a platform for all those people with intellectual disabilities to have fun, compete on a daily basis. We do uh, basketball practices, different sports, depending on what you like. Mm-hmm. But we also provide mm-hmm. them a health, uh, health clinic. It's okay. Nowadays, when we started, it was more uh, 
just giving them a platform for them to compete. But now, Special mm-hmm. Olympics has evolved in the sense that we're doing it unified. We're not putting them on the side for them to have their own moment. We want them to be together with everybody else, competing and mm-hmm. having fun. And one of the, the, the um, athletes' uh, thing was, uh, it's uh, let me win. And if I can't, let me be brave in that tent. That's uh, mm-hmm. the motto yeah. for the athletes for Special Olympics. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's all those people, basically, regardless of age, sex, or uh, uh, color, whichever it may be. As long as you have intellectual disability, the Special Olympics was created thanks to uh, Eunice Kennedy, that uh, may she rest in peace. She was the founder due to the fact that one of her sisters had it growing up, was uh, was uh, deficient, intellectually deficient, and she played sports herself. From seeing how sports had uh, such impact on herself, she kind of saw sports in an area that can unify so many uh, people. So she started bringing yeah. people with intellectual disability together, and that's how mm-hmm. Special Olympics uh, was created. Very good, very yeah. good. So um, the organization started in the United States, but now it's it's kind of all across the world, it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. Yes, it yeah. started in the U.S. Now we have different regions, the Europe, uh, Africa, uh, America, uh, I think Asia, part, there's... Uh, we do the world games and everyone comes together. It's something to see. Sometimes I tell people, yeah. like, when you try to explain Special Olympics, it's mm-hmm. hard. People don't, don't you, you cannot feel it well till you go to an event and see them. The joy, mm-hmm. they make you uh, see life in a different way. Because sometimes mm-hmm. we, we not, not, but in general, we sometimes tend to be ungrateful. We, we take things for granted, I would say. But seeing mm-hmm. them, the courage that they have, and the joy, you have to, people put them in a, in a box. But get to know them. You'll be so surprised. Mm-hmm. They are mm-hmm. capable of so much. And they will teach you a, a thing or two about life. Yeah, yeah. I think it would really be a, a wonderful experience to um, volunteer with the organization. I, I have um, a couple of patients that um, routinely participate in the uh, Special Olympics, but I've actually never been to uh, any of the events. Um, but as I was preparing for this episode, yeah. I was, you know, getting excited about yeah. it. And, you know, it would be really nice to actually see um, see this in action. Um, and I know that there's, there's people that um, volunteer and do it for a, a long term and it sounds like everyone really enjoys the experience so yeah. <laughs> it, it's contagious yeah. when you go and you 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 part of it it's a movement that uh you, you just have to go feel it when you mm-hmm. see it from far it's not the same that's how i, I see it from the images and mm-hmm. stuff to me it's not the same you have to be really in it mm-hmm. yeah yeah so um our are there um, a very wide range of sports that are available usually with the Special Olympics? Yes. I, I would say we have practically all the sports that normal people play. They, they, they do all those. But in Mali, for instance, we don't have access to all the amenities and stuff, but we do have basketball. We started first with uh, soccer. And mm-hmm. track and field, which are easy, okay. as you know, in Africa, you just put the yes. the cones and you can play soccer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was the easy one. And running was also came easy to us, so we did run, running. And of okay. course, having a basketball background, Special Olympic mm-hmm. cannot be <laughs> mm-hmm. in Mali and not 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 have basketball. So yes, <laughs> we we had in basketball, and um, we at times we did our uh, swimming, but we don't have a uh, a lot of our swimming pool in Mali, in that sense, uh, that yeah. we could go because if you have to go to some other places, it will be very costly for us. And mm-hmm. our program doesn't have as much means to afford that. So we mm-hmm. have about a couple of athletes that do very well in swimming. And uh, they have mm-hmm. actually joined the, the local swimming teams in that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So who are the people that you find to help with the... Um, I guess, training of the athletes and with um, running some of the events? Um. 
when when I went back, given that I'm not physically in Mali right now, I go back and forth. Uh, I had a, a group of people that I that I've approached when I came up with the idea of, and uh, once I had the approval of a Swiss Olympic Africa to start a program in Mali, I reached out to some people, explained to them uh, what the project it was about, my vision, and uh, how I would like them to see the uh, the, the program. And I had some people that believe in the in the process and wanted to be part of it. So it's non-profit, of course. It's based on uh, uh, volunteering. So we have uh, two. We have a national director that's uh, that we pay, and uh, assistant national director, and also a sports director. The rest of them, are, it's okay. not even. I can't even say that we pay them because it's so minimal. But for what they do, we don't pay them enough, seriously, because they are so involved and uh, want to see the program go far. And um, they have the 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 key players in there keeping the program mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Those those uh, uh, that that team, and also we have some people that come and help us volunteering, but we do need more mm -hmm. volunteer in Africa. As you may be aware, volunteering is not a concept that's well into our culture as much. Mm -hmm. So it's a challenge mm -hmm. to get uh, people to come and volunteer. volunteer. Mm -hmm. So if you had to say what uh, some of the main needs would be for the organization, for your branch in, in Mali, what are some of the things that you guys are always looking for? Well, the, the biggest challenge is uh, we still have a way to go in um, uh, getting uh, people more sensibilized do more sensibilization because, uh, again, it's still taboo. They hide them. So that's something, that campaign area is something that we need more help, getting more uh, more players out. We started with the goal of getting 300 per year. We've been going now seven years. We have close to 3,000 athletes. We are wow. above our target, but still the program is not where we would like to be in a sense that our goal was to have it in all the region of Mali. We don't, unfortunately. We are more, more. Um, we are steady in Bamako in the capital, and we have three regions that we've been able to uh, to be in, or we have four. But the other ones, due to the security in Mali, also it doesn't help, but we would like to get the means, of course, whether it's financially or uh, uh, human capital, human, uh, to get uh, the help on that and be more present in Mali and touch more mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like there's there's still some work to be done, but yes. definitely it, it starts with um, changing people's perspectives, yes. letting them know that there, there is... Um, there are opportunities for people with intellectual disabilities and there's ways that we can help um, these people with intellectual disabilities um, go farther and accomplish more. Yes, certainly, yeah. certainly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now I know that you mentioned that um, there is the Special Olympics World Games that everyone mm -hmm. kind of comes together for. Are there, how often do those happen? Because I actually didn't know that it was um, on that level. I thought that most of it happens with the Special Olympics branches putting on their own events locally. Yes, they, they, they do games locally. We have, for okay. instance, our national uh, championship, national games, where we okay. bring uh, all the athletes from different regions and they compete. And it's based okay. on that that we do select the athletes that will participate in the World Games. Our mm -hmm. first World Game was uh, in the in LA in 1915. I mean, uh, 2015. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> 2015 in LA. That was our mm -hmm. very first game. We brought a uh, track and field only. Uh, okay. Two boys and uh, two, 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 two ladies. So mm -hmm. we had a uh, track and field. And the next game was in Dubai. I believe that was 2019. Oh, wow. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. was that was a uh, huge. We were able to bring a basketball team, unified basketball and track and field. Uh -huh. And also, after that, they started a, the African region doesn't have a, I believe all the other regions have their own games. Africa mm -hmm. just started one this year, or 20, 
either 2019 or 2020. Yeah, beginning January, right before COVID exploded. 2020 January. Yeah. It was oh, okay. the Pan African Games that were mm-hmm. held in, um, in Egypt. Mm-hmm. So, and the games, they basically every four years, and it's based on quota. They uh, allocate number of athletes that you can have. I guess based on your okay. program uh, strength, you can bring more uh, discipline. You kind of, uh, how you say, they put out, these are the disciplines that are going to be there. And you kind mm-hmm. of say, okay, I'm going to be there in this discipline. And now you have to mm-hmm. do fundraising to be able to bring in your athletes. So okay. it's very costly because not only you have to bring your athletes, but we go with a quota of uh, for every about four to five artists, you have to have one uh, one coach or one uh, helper. So that mm-hmm. being your uh, team, the number of people that you have to travel with, it makes mm-hmm. it more. Mm-hmm. So those are all things that you have to take into consideration, the number of people that yes. you bring along. Yes, I see. I yeah. see. Okay, okay. And now with your uh, branch, because I think when I was looking back on some of this, I saw that, uh, those who participate in the Special Olympics are not just children um, and adolescents, but this can be adults anywhere yeah. up to 60, 70 yeah. years. Is that how your branch runs as well? You have yeah. it for across all ages. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Wow. That's the, the beauty about Special Olympics. There's no age limit. We will mm-hmm. eight, as, as early as eight years old, we have the young mm-hmm. athletes. So we have okay. things just for them. And yes. we have also grown-ups that, that come in as long as they're willing to to play and do something, we we bring them mm-hmm. in. It's open mm-hmm. to every all of them. Any of them that want to yes. come in, some of them we have some that went from uh playing for many years and now they're coaching. That's for amazing. Us. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. very good. Full yeah. circle. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. So when it comes to sensitizing the uh, society or community, what are some of the um what are some of the ways that you guys have approached this? Um, do you have any involvement with schools or, or things like that? How are you getting the word out about, about Special Olympics in Mali? Those, those are still some areas that we are looking. Some of the, we've reached out to, uh, we have uh, what we call a uh, head of, a uh, uh, not city, but head of uh, subdivisions. Okay. Kind of like mayors. And mm-hmm. we reach out to those also uh, anytime we have an event, we try to uh, have them uh, get access to TVs or newspapers to talk about what okay. we are doing. We mm-hmm. haven't been the best in social media, which is something we have to uh, work in to get a, mm-hmm. because that's a free platform that we need to use a yeah. lot more, definitely. Yeah. And mm-hmm. um, it's, our biggest stuff is reaching out to families. They've been our ad- advocate in the sense that not many of them are comfortable doing it. So the ones that have been willing to partner with us because we have a family uh, uh, as a group also. So mm-hmm. the parents, they have the one who, once we get the, uh, those that can bring their kids, we kind of tell them, if you know any other one, please let them know, let them know that we are here and we want them to join us. So mm-hmm. those are stuff and uh word to mouth is something also that we do use mm-hmm. and we've uh used the foundation I've, i went um and created my my uh, non-profit also the uh, just made foundation and we've mm-hmm. kind of used that also to uh, reach out to the basketball players because many of them didn't know about special olympics either because mm-hmm. growing up mm-hmm. unfortunately when we see uh, uh those with intellectual disabilities i been I've been guilty of that myself. I would say at a young age, when you see them, we don't. It's not nice, you know. People see them, they feel like you no, know, they're retarded. They, it's it's mean. And those are Special Olympic are completely banned. The word are uh, mm. are the retarded, you know, because we don't want to use it. They're not retarded. You have to yeah. get to know them. The sickness they yeah. have, but when we go to our camp, you have to see the things that they're able to do. When we yeah. brought them with people that you call normal, they were teaching them some of the plays that we just showed all of them together. That's mm-hmm. how smart mm-hmm. they are. Yes. So yes. definitely we've used the, the platform, the basketball platform to reach out to more people. 
to get them uh, to be known. And but again, like I said, we still have a long way to go. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, and you you um, were just talking about your foundation, HMB Foundation, Hamsha Trimaigapa. And what is what is the focus of, of that organization? Uh, basically, through through the foundation, foundation, what we try to do is uh, my something that's been always dear to me is the fact that uh, being in Mali or Africa in general, we are not given the opportunity to be true student athletes. At one point, you have to give up your studies or sports to choose one or the other. And again, I was fortunate to have parents who made sure that I don't make that choice. I, I have to get disciplined and do the work needed, have the work it takes to uh, do well in both areas. And it, may was, uh, it, may, it was made uh, much easier, not easier, but possible by coming to U.S. And in Mali, the goal is to use uh, the basketball as a pathway uh, to education, but also inclusion. And the education is for all, of course, but we mm-hmm. focus a lot more on girls who are not given a lot of opportunities, whether it's the education part or the sports area. Mm-hmm. And inclusion, again, we, we brought back the Special Olympic part because, yeah. like I said, when I used to go back home, I'd do camps just for uh, anyone that played basketball. There was no criteria. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I did the things for Special Olympic different, just Special Olympic people. Then through the foundation now, we do camps when we bring everybody together. But now you don't have to, you have to be a student, but also have good grades in school. We have a grade that we tell them you have to have this grade. So throughout the school year, they're working toward a goal to attain if they want to come to our camps. Mm-hmm. And also, it's an opportunity for us to have the unified concept of Special Olympics, where our athletes get to compete with uh, normal people through basketball uh, practices and stuff, and we do life skills events. It, it's something to see how the kids uh, open up to them. And a lot of them, we got a lot of partners through that that would come. They say they'll be willing to come and practice with them when we need them. Yeah. So that was nice. Yeah. That was something mm-hmm. that uh, uh, was a joy to see, and uh, it gives you uh, hope that we can use that platform to get more people to be involved with Special Olympics. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's that's a beautiful idea, you know, really um, starting from the younger ages, you know, to introduce them to this idea of inclusion and getting them to see people with disabilities in a different way. And I like what you said about being able to see what they're capable of doing rather than just the way we might normally look at what their their disability is or what they're lacking. Yeah. You know, so I think that that's that's a wonderful, a wonderful way to, to accomplish that. And I, I like the fact that you um, are setting educational goals for them as well um, so that people know that things kind of go hand in hand, you know, yeah. and um, you're giving yourself as much opportunity as you can um, in life. So I think you guys are doing a wonderful job. Thank you. <laughs> Kudos to you. And I, I'm hoping for um you know, more growth for you in the future and, and just more opportunities to impact people's lives because I know that that's, that's what you're doing um, and I think that this is really great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I always say I didn't have any other choice but that I was fortunate to have the path that I was uh, given. Granted, I always say, yes, I've worked hard. I It didn't come to me easy, but I do know also that I uh, I come across a lot of people that were impactful in what I've been able to accomplish. So it's only yeah. normal for me to go back, give back, and uh, bring along some other people for them to benefit from uh, my experience, certainly. Yes, yes. Um, and I know that you work with and you must come across so many athletes. You said you have up to 3,000 um, athletes in your Special Olympics uh, program right now, which is phenomenal. Do you have any um, particular story that has stood out uh, for you for um, uh, one of your athletes or their family who, through the Special Olympics, has been able to see a change in their life? Well, I would say, yeah, there's a couple. Uh, the, the one, her case is uh, Sally. She, um, she cannot even talk well. But uh, every time 
she comes to Special Olympics to our event and stuff. She came to the World Game in LA, and I believe she she won the the medal in the I think hundred meter or so. She is um, one of those that resilient. She's a joy to be around, and she's not a, she's not shy. So when I when I see her, the confidence that she she shows, it's a I can't I can't describe it, but every time I I think of her and her and I is like from the beginning the program started we just it, it's you know it's like it was meant to be so mm -hmm. when I see her it doesn't matter where she is at she would run as if like we we were always friends you know and it doesn't matter how long we stayed and I I don't see her but just to joy that she shows. Mm -hmm. it's th that mm -hmm. impact that's always that's always touched me that sometimes we we like i was saying we uh we take things for granted but yeah. she's happy yeah. to just be out there and competing mm -hmm. so that that's mm -hmm. something that's always i keep in back of my head that if i'm able to bring that small joy to her life i'm thankful for that and yeah. giving yeah. her the opportunity to travel and see the world you know mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's that's something that uh bring me joy and there is another one, um, uh, Badra, we call him Bedos. He's also someone who's uh, always believed in himself. He's resilient, works hard, and went through all the Special Olympic stuff. He's one of uh, the ones that now is uh, work does kinesiotherapy mm -hmm. and also uh, is a coach for us. So those mm. are stories that when I when I think yeah. back and I look, I know it's not just us being there, but their own resilience want wanted to be better mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. keeping keep pushing despite all the uh, challenges that they, they have faced. Yeah. So yeah. those those are very motivational when I think of them. Yeah. 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 yeah that's that's a beautiful story to to yeah. know that what you're you're doing is not only. Um, affecting people for a short period of time but it's having a, a ripple impact as well the people that you were training and giving yeah. opportunities are now and being yeah. able to train yeah. and give opportunities to other people as well yeah. and inspire other people so yeah, yeah and yeah, he's getting ready amazing. to get married in august oh yeah it's exciting <laughs> that's yeah. beautiful yes yes it's nice yeah. yes Yep, yep. very good yeah. very good mm -hmm. well Hamsha to thank you so 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 much for um, being on the show for sharing all your experiences with us for um, inspiring us here with everything that you have been doing um, I wish you more and more um, success and um, for people to come across this episode and um, and hopefully join forces with you and the things that you're doing and be able to provide um, some assistance as well. I wanted to give you an opportunity to um, just mention your the website of your foundation and um, if the Special Olympics in Mali, if they have a, a, a website as well, if you could mention that for people who are interested. Okay. Thank you, Fon. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, like I mentioned, and uh, thank you for all that you are doing and sharing also uh, uh, your experience because as you go through this pod podcast and stuff you get to uh, educate people so thank you for taking the time out to do so and um, yes yeah, Special Olympic Mali um, has a and um, it's still under a we have a Facebook page but also through the foundation web website website uh, we have a link in there where you can get more information and the link to the foundation is uh, HMB Foundation that all Okay. HMB okay. Foundation that work. Okay. Or you can That's just perfect. put the Hamshi to make about foundation, but Hamshi to is hard to write. <laughs> 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 so I'll, I'll put the HMB in the show notes for people yes, to click on. <laughs> HMB Foundation. We we had we had Hamshi to initially, but we we're like this is hard. Nobody can write your name. I don't know why you're putting that. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. 
Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much again. I've really, really enjoyed having you uh, on here. And um, yes, we hope to hear more um, from you guys about, about what you accomplish in the years to come. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. All right. Take care. You too.